Hi. So uh, as I said before, I'm a principal at O'Reilly Alphatech Ventures, which means I'm a VC, and one of the areas that I've focused on is hardware. So I'm giving a talk today called Hardware by the Numbers, um, and I want to walk through some of the interesting trends that are happening in the hardware ecosystem, particularly starting with what's happening in the very beginning, uh, which is the startups. So we've probably all heard this you know, 50 times on this stage alone. Hardware is hard. Uh, it gets a little bit old you know, to hear it, but it really is true. And one of the things that's really interesting about hardware is that we still talk about it as a category. So the fact that I was up here announcing a hardware startup showcase winner, um, it's, it's a bit perplexing because when most VCs talk about what they invest in in software, they talk about subsets. They talk about SaaS, mobile, social, local. Um, there's a specificity that's already arrived in software that we haven't seen in hardware yet. And part of that is because it's such a relatively new category. And that's one of the reasons why it's so exciting to see what people are able to do today. So it used to be really difficult to start a hardware company. Uh, perhaps you worked in R&D at, at a bigger company. Perhaps you worked with an agency. But it was a real big challenge to take a product to market and to build a business around a device. Um, and then the internet happened. And one of the really fascinating things about the internet was its ability to bring people together. You know, if you've ever heard Chris Anderson, uh, the CEO of 3D Robotics, give a talk on how he founded his company, he talks about putting out a Ning community and saying, I'm really interested in drones. Who else is interested in drones? Um, and, and actually finding a co-founder and building an entire business around these sort of community that he was able to grow on the internet. And then the internet has also facilitated the rise of offline real-world communities, which are particularly important for hardware, where you have to be together in the same place to make a thing. So what you're seeing here, and I apologize. I know that many of you probably can't see the axes on the bottom there, and that's one of my pet peeves. But um, the, uh, these are the new hacker spaces appearing in the real world every year. So this is not cumulative. This is new, devices, uh, sorry, new spaces. And we're seeing right now about 200 a year for the last four or five years. Some of them are specific to hardware. Some of them are hardware plus software. Some of them have two people. Some of them have hundreds. Um, but what you're seeing is this gathering together of people who are interested in hardware as a category. And that's really driving um, community. Um, you know, we, we see 530 hackerspaces in the US. This is a global movement. 106 countries are represented. Um, and you know, specific to the US, we see California leading the pack right now with 68 hackerspaces, um, and a new one either being planned or added somewhere around the country every month. So this is a big movement. Um, I think Maker Media, Maker Faire above all, deserves a lot of, uh, of kudos for turning this into something that's really part of the public consciousness now. Um, it's inspiring millions. It's giving people an audience, a place to show off their work, to find like-minded people. Um, and since 2006, attendance has grown steadily. And in 2013, we hit the year of 100 Maker Faires, uh, the community events as well as the, uh, you know, the official sponsored fairs. Now, maker and um, hacker activity, of course, isn't necessarily the same as people starting a company. So what you're seeing here is community growth among hardware startup uh, meetups, meetup.com. Go type in your city, type in hardware startup founder, uh, and you'll find these communities. This is a graph of attendance at the San Francisco meetup. Uh, when Nick Pinkston started in 2011, there were about 100 people. And I think we crossed about 3,000 earlier this year. And over the past few years, you know, we have these support structures that are really making it possible for these companies to come to market. Um, Hack Accelerator, Highway One, um, all of the accelerators on here, they're really making an effort to, uh, to facilitate the growth of the hardware startup ecosystem. And there are way too many logos to throw up there on the support ecosystem slide. But what you're looking at here is basically, after you start the business and make the thing, you have to sell the thing. And that's really, in many ways, that's the hard part. Um, and these are, these are a number of startups that have facilitated um, their startups themselves, and they have facilitated um, support structures for distribution, fulfillment, logistics, and all of the areas that are the kind of dirty underbelly of the hardware after you've produced the device. Um, you know, all the, all the support systems in the world and community means nothing if you don't have the underlying technology to make your thing. Um, so we're going to do a quick walk through prototyping trends here. I don't want to bore you because I know, uh, you know Carl gave a great talk on this, <laughs> a full talk on this earlier. Um, and that's one of the things about this talk. It's kind of a conglomeration of many different areas. But uh, Gartner Research and some of the analysts have started tracking 3D printers as under $100,000 as a category for the first time ever, uh, enterprise-grade printers, and looking at this as a market and saying it's extrapolated to double between 2014 and 2015. Rapid quality, better performance, uh, that's what's really driving this demand. 
And the, uh, you know, the kind of take-home message of that research report was that enterprise-quality printers will cost less than $2,000 by 2016, uh, which really makes it, you know, as Carl said, what matters is what they make, not the fact that the printer exists. And so we're seeing the high-end um, high possibilities coming down to a price point that's feasible for, for many more people. Um, and just to touch briefly on the strictly consumer kind of first, you know, first taste of the industry kind of thing, um, we're seeing a number of sub $500 printers. Uh, and if you compare that to the price of the early MakerBot cupcakes and some of the other kits from four years ago, that's, a, again, a pretty substantial decrease in price. So prices are declining. Both consumers and enterprise are buying. I'm sorry, again, it's probably a little bit difficult to read these, but this whole deck is going to be posted online uh, so you can kind of dig into the data and see what's, what's underneath. Um, but these adoption trends are often compared to the PC revolution of the 1990s. Um, you know, 3D printing is for your form prototype. You have to, if you're producing a device, you've got to still do functional prototyping. Um, so for a functional prototype, you're building the guts, and we have single board computers, uh, Wi-Fi enabled development boards, microcontrollers, uh, things that have enabled fast and efficient prototyping at a price point that, again, anyone, even a beginner, can learn and a hobbyist can, uh, can get their feet wet. Um, I'm super excited about this. I think the Octopart team is here. But um, when I told them I was interested in doing a talk, really getting into the numbers and trends underlying hardware, I had asked, can you help me figure out what boards people are using? And that's actually a pretty tall order. But what we can do is we can look at the price of a single board. So what you're seeing, this is a graph showing percentage price change. So uh, zero is the kind of um, midline axis there. So as you look, you see the price of a single microcontroller dropping, except for that small uptick at the end there. And the um, volume pricing is, is the red line up top increasing. Um, so Octopart has a lot of fantastic data about uh, economies of scale, about pricing, about ways that producing at scale can help you take your bomb to a price point that's feasible for, uh, for actually creating a device and really building a business and getting out of the hobbyist market and into the business market. Um, so again, talking about economies of scale, uh, hardware was hard because China is far. Uh, China is still far. Um, but manufacturing halfway around the world is actually progressively easier now for companies at, at all sizes. Um, again, I, I kind of shouted out Hackcelerator and how I went a bit earlier. This is where I meant to do that. Um, they take their startups, uh, their, their classes, to China and walk them through sourcing, the Haqing Bay marketplace, a lot of the um, kind of guts that goes into uh, managing an outsourced supply, uh, sorry, a, a distant supply chain. Um, Alibaba is a fantastic place to source components. You just go on, you type what you're looking for, you can, uh, you can see what's out there. It's sort of the front end to Shenzhen, basically. Um, even Fortune 500 companies rely on some of the other names that are up there on that slide to help manage distant supply chains. Uh, but it's no longer immediately obvious where to get things made, and this is one of the really interesting trends where manufacturing and economics kind of overlap. We have offshoring, which is sending to China, reshoring, bringing it back, nearshoring, uh, which is, you know, predicated upon what geographical area you live in, in the US, that's come to mean Mexico. Um, in Silicon Valley Bank's uh, startup survey 2013, they found that 58% of hardware startups were actually planning to manufacture in the US because manufacturing is extremely challenging. Uh, but interestingly, in another survey run by BCG, 37% of companies with annual sales over a billion dollars are also expressing the same thing. Uh, and this is uh, the China PMI. PMI is a purchasing manager's index. What this is showing is um, it tracks five trends, um, new orders, output, employment, uh, supplier delivery, stocks. And it kind of comes up with a composite number. And 50% 50, uh, 50 over there is break even. And, um, and you're, what you're seeing is kind of decreasing demand for manufacturing in China um, over time here. The pace of the drop is slowing a bit. Um, but this is one of the main reasons why. This is wages, Mexico versus China. So this is, again, getting into the economics of nearshoring. Um, so it's now, in, in many industries, this is not specific solely to manufacturing. It's pretty tough to find those isolated numbers. But what you're seeing here is, uh, is overall factory labor work. So in a number of industries, we're to the point where manufacturing in Mexico is actually uh, can be cheaper than manufacturing in China. And then the other considerations driving nearshoring as a potential trend are the cost of shipping a 40-foot container, particularly to the east coast of the US, uh, the exchange rate, time differences, language barriers, splitting your team. Anybody here who's ever tried to manage a supply chain with someone in China knows that you have to put a person in the factory. And oftentimes, uh, finding out who that person is going to be is, uh, is particularly difficult for a small company. 
Um, so reshoring is largely made possible by robots. This is kind of a trend within a trend. Uh, industrial robots per 100,000 employees. Uh, you see China kind of way down at the bottom there with only two robots per, um, per 100,000 employees. So this is interesting in part because we're seeing um, robotics is really moving this along to a point where uh, you're going to see a lot of demand, even within China, as labor costs are so high, uh, they need to sort of um, to begin to use mechanical labor in China as well. Um, you know, a typical robot was formerly about $100,000. Now we've seen some of these guys up here talking. Um, they're not necessarily all doing the same things. They all perform different functions. But we're seeing, again, a drop in price of robotics, changing manufacturing and making it more feasible to, uh, to make a thing. Um, getting into the kind of guts of the finance sector here, hardware was hard because investors were scared. Um, you know, we're going to kind of flip through this one relatively quickly, but crowdfunding really fundamentally changed um, hardware startups in the sense that originally you had to reach out to a VC with no proof of concept, no prototype. It was very difficult to do that. But what we have here is we have hardware projects on Kickstarter, and then if you look at the year-over-year -year growth, 2012 and then 2013, you're seeing in, in all stats, uh, hardware projects, product design projects, total projects are increasing, but hardware as a percentage of category in both dollars and projects created and money raised um, is really taking off. Consumers are particularly interested and people are actively looking at Kickstarter as a way to find these cool new things. VCs are participating as well. Here's another eye chart for you, but the, uh, the take home message here is that um, this is sub Series A funding events. So, Series A and below funding events. This does include medical devices, but every year there are more VC investors participating in this space. Hardware companies raise more uh, as a tribute to how kind of capital intensive they are. Um, but follow ons are also tough. So, about 20% or so of the companies can kind of go on and raise uh, the second round. Hardware, it's actually only around 9% right now. And it's going to be interesting to see if that continues to change as some of these other trends uh, come into play. But looking at total dollars across all stages, it's pretty clear that now is a great time to be a hardware startup raising money. Um, you know, these are kind of the four categories that we see most companies coming out in. Design products is not often funded by VCs because it's not necessarily very defensible tech, um, but Quirky and some other really awesome communities are out there to help people um, take uh, design products to market. Um, oh, this one's kind of cool also. So UAVs, as I mentioned drones before, um, that's that new category that's just starting to come up, and it hit $80 million in funding in 2013. Um, and again, I'm kind of breezing through these pretty quickly, but the slides will be posted online, and it's all in D3, so you can kind of get in the guts and check it out. Um, one of the reasons why hardware is becoming more popular as a category for VCs is that we're starting to see exits. Uh, you know, this is, again, I think Google bought seven robotics companies last year alone. Uh, you know, don't be evil. And then uh, we, had <laughs> we had exits in virtual reality, um, in 3D printing, in connected devices as well. Um, so this is really kind of why we're all here. Uh, pretty soon, saying connected devices is going to be like saying personal computer was in the 1990s, because most devices are going to be connected. Um, on the Internet of Things, nobody knows you're a fridge, uh, or a toaster, <laughs> uh, or a cow. Um, we heard about the Internet of Cows yesterday. They're fitted to um, you know, RFID tags in the ear. Some of them are robotically milked. Um, each cow transmits about 200 megabytes of data per year. Um, and all of these kind of cows, fridges, and toasters uh, mean that the technology and the shape of the internet is going to change as well as we move from M to M, you know, as, as we move from traditional human to human data transfer patterns to M to M, where we're going to need orders of magnitude more nodes, uh, traffic is going to be upload biased, and we're going to see the rise of a series of low bandwidth, low power, real time devices. Um, 2008, uh, the number of devices connected to the internet surpassed the number of people on Earth. Um, and then here is kind of our timeline. Uh, again, I think someone alluded to this before, but um, depending on which analyst report you read, you're going to get a different number for that 2020 uh, factor there. But um, even at 50 billion, that's actually only 2.7% of the things in the world. So we do still have quite a long way to go. Um, the connections are, are typically dominated by two sectors. One is consumer electronics, largely around entertainment. Um, and the second is intelligent buildings, like uh, HVAC systems and security. Between them, they account for almost 70% of the total. So people are paying attention, and people are paying money. 
Um, you know, 71 billion is the, uh, is the projected number of revenues from these connected home, specifically systems, in 2018. And again, that, that is quite a bit of, um, of entertainment, uh, entertainment model pricing in there. Um, one final subset, just to briefly touch on before I run out of time here. Um, Mary Meeker alluded to this last year, and it's a really interesting thing, which is wearables, um, as, a, as a trend, have come on much faster than the normal 10-year adoption cycle. Um, I think one of the reasons for that is the prevalence of emphasis on user experience and user experience design. And um, as we've moved into this idea that you can uh, operate a device immediately upon taking it out of the box, wearables have become fabulously popular. Um, and this, I think, is, I think this is particularly interesting. So this is the projected growth of wearables. The smaller boxes on the bottom are the percentage that are going to have embedded cellular. And then that red line down there, um, that's the install base of connected appliances projected on top of wearables. So what you're seeing is really the expectation of wearables as a category, um, orders of magnitude higher than, uh, than connected home appliances. And that's largely because they're lower friction, they're lower cost, and also people intuitively know what to do with them out of the box. It's sort of a, um, a gateway drug. But finding the killer app for the home appliances, Internet of Things, it's really not quite there yet. Um, so make no mistake about it, you know, hardware is still hard, but the future is bright. You know, we're seeing trends across the ecosystem in prototyping, manufacturing, fundraising, and they all indicate that it's getting progressively easier to go from an idea on a napkin uh, to a space on the shelf. Um, and to quote a big software guy, uh, six decades into the computer revolution, four decades into the invention of the, since the invention of the microprocessor, and two decades into the rise of the modern internet, all of the technology required to transform industries through software finally works and can be delivered at a global scale. And now, while it may be early to make the same claim about hardware, the hardware revolution is underway, and we've seen that here over the last two days. And that means that we're in for some truly exciting developments as today's creators leverage the power of software and the promise of hardware and bring new and compelling connected devices into the world. Thank you.